Thanks to Regina and uh, ITS America for putting on this conference, as also including AWS as a part of this really important conversation. Uh, from my background, you saw I came from government. I've also worked in nonprofit and private sector, and it's really that collaboration uh, that the secretary talked about just a, just a little bit ago that is so important to really driving innovation. And uh, platforms like this are extremely important. And so we're, we're really excited to be here and to be working with you, as well as to be part of that challenge uh, for, the, for the Smart Cities Challenge. So uh, there's, uh, when I was trained around videos and video, uh, um, I'm sorry, around pre presentations, one of the key things in every presentation when I was told is to have a video. So I, I'm, we're going to start with a video, but we had to pick the right one. And in the spirit of the future of transportation, we wanted to start with one of the uh, biggest transportation missions there is. So with that, let's, let's roll the video. Take a few moments to learn how, in just 60 minutes, NASA can process a day's worth of new discoveries from the Mars Science Laboratory. The red plains and pink sky of Mars hint that volcanoes, meteors, and flash floods once shaped the landscape. Today, a number of robots sent by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory explore the atmosphere and surface of Mars. These rovers are on a quest to find out whether the red planet is, or ever was, an environment able to support life. However, giving instructions to a Mars rover is more difficult than most people realize. Unfortunately, there's no joystick controller a scientist can use to move the rover around. And even at the speed of light, it still takes between seven and 20 minutes for a transmission to go from Earth, across space, to the rover on Mars. To make matters even more complicated, there are only short periods of time in which scientists can communicate with the rover at all. This makes for a precious window of time in which NASA JPL engineers must determine the next day's mission for the rover. Sometimes they have just a few hours to download data from the rover, then process and interpret that data in order to send new mission instructions back to Mars. When they can speed up the analysis of the data, it leaves more time for science. That's why the team uses Amazon Web Services to spin up hundreds of Intel Xeon E5 processors when they're needed. With the scale and performance of this on-demand computational cluster, NASA JPL engineers are able to drive 12 teraflops of performance for less than $40 an hour. This leaves more time to work on programming Curiosity's next steps. It also enables NASA to get greater utilization of the rover's unique capabilities. Closer to home, NASA JPL scientists also use Amazon Web Services and Intel Xeon E5 processors for other computationally intensive workloads, such as robotic articulation calculations and Arctic climate analysis, all while enabling their researchers to work more productively and cost-effectively. When the team needs more computational power to support these and many other missions, they can easily provision what they need as and when they need it. This on-demand scalability lets NASA scientists and engineers keep their focus on exploring the Earth, the solar system, and the universe beyond. So the old way was all about procuring hardware for your peak moment, right? When you had a lot of uh, need, but only in, in a few uh, moments of, of time. And that had a lot of waste in it, right? You, you, only, you bought a whole bunch of hardware and you're stuck with it. And then it's hard to innovate. And you, you, you aren't able to get the resources you need when you need them. So, the, the new way uh, is without that large upfront capital investment. And you, over the web or through a direct connection, you can on demand get secure, stable, and low cost infrastructure to run your business, to address your challenges. And in the, you know, that example with NASA, you're, you're talking about 10 times more data for one hundredth of the cost. Uh, in fact, we've reduced our prices more than 50 times since inception. And that allows folks to speed their path to innovation. Yet, a lot of folks wonder about the cloud, right? And, and what, what is it? When I talk to my mom about it, uh, she thinks about it in terms of, you know, a place for her photos and documents. Logical, right? 
Now, when I think about it, I think about all of these things. All the things that you see up here are all services that are enabling you to do your business in a completely different way. And I don't want to go through all of these. We don't have time to go through all these, but I do want to give you an example of one, which is our data warehousing tool. It's called Redshift. So you can go online and use our Redshift tool, which is a, is a data warehousing service that you can customize. You can put a petabyte of data in it for a year, and it costs $1,000. That's a game changer. We, we had one customer who uh, wanted to take massive amounts of data and put it in there um, f and, and use the, used the data warehousing to use Redshift for, for three months. They spent $4,500 and found $6 million worth of fraud. It just When you start to think about these tools and you think about how can you incorporate these services into your business, it allows you a lot more freedom and to think about your business in a completely different way. And coming from government, when I was leaving government, a lot of people were like, mm, Frank, I don't know about that cloud thing. I don't know, is it going to be secure? And um, what I can tell you is it is. It's extremely secure, and it, it's security built into the model. You know, um, ISO uh, uh, 2701, SOC 1, SOC 2, DISO 1 through 5, um, FedRAMP, a uh, lot of international certifications, CGIS for police, HIPAA for health, um, uh, Major Motion Picture Association. We're constantly working in accrediting our infrastructure to provide you robust security around all of this. So a lot of times now, I, I, when my friends run into me that I was talking to before I left, I get to say cloud is a thing, right? It turns out cloud's a, cloud's a thing. And um, it's, there's, there's sort of a well-trodden path now where um, it, it has different phases, sort of an, an ebb and flow, and it's not one way, but what we do see is organizations and enterprises moving development and test and then building all together new apps uh, on AWS. And then they start moving their, um, their digital and analytics and mobile applications. And then the third phase is the, the data center migration and moving mission critical production apps before they, they go all in. And there's, as I said, there's no one way to do this. So it's not like you have to follow this path. It's just we're seeing this path. And it's, it's well, um, well trodden. And here's some of, the, some of the ones that you might recognize uh, these various, various logos. Uh, but these are all folks that have gone on this journey. And, and I want to talk about Netflix. Because Netflix's share of internet traffic is exploding. The streaming service as of May in 2015 accounts for over 35% of all bandwidth consumed by North American web users during prime time. And in 2009, Netflix took on the challenge to build a global internet television service. And um, they started with big data platform and started the shift to um, on-prem to AWS. And now Netflix delivers billion of hours of content globally running on AWS. And they want to make sure when you turn on Netflix, when you go there for your movie, it works. And we're there for them when they're looking to do that. Um, I want to talk about FINRA, uh, one of the other ones on here. It's the largest financial regulator in the US. They collect and analyze billions of brokerage transactions daily using Amazon Web Services. They move to AWS for better analytics on big data, cost effective, and they have volumes that can, um, during, during heavy trading, that will peak three times what their normal workload is. And they're allowed, the, the elasticity of the cloud it scales up and scales down with them, and they're only paying for what they use. And I want to give you transportation around um, Transport for London. Uh, there are 30 million journeys are made every day in London by buses, through the tube, cycling, light rail, uh, the tram, river, walking. It's one of the most complex transportation networks in the world. And tfl.gov.uk, um, which is one of the, the most marketed websites in the UK, everyone uses trust and needs real-time information for their journeys. 
I was at a presentation they gave at, at one of our events, and somebody said, how many people here go on tfl.gov? And the whole room raised, raised their hands. It was pretty awesome. Um, in 2012, they decided to re-engineer their website to deal with high volumes, location capabilities, and be more personalized for the 3 million page views a day, 18,000 stops, 700 bus routes, and 750,000 journey plan requests per day. And that requires lots of data. And, the, and when you have 130,000 predictions every 30 seconds, you can't have latency in that data. And the cloud is enabling them to build and to, to uh, test and experiment and meet the demands of this large transportation um, uh, base, customers base. All right, so when I, was, um, when I left the administration and before I started Amazon, I started to think, well, what's going on here right now? Like, how, and, and how can government work more like open table, right? And I, I wrote a paper, it's, it's like, can government work like open table, funny enough? But the, um, if you think about open table, how many folks here like use the restaurant booking tools and so on, right? Well, in the old days, we used to um, look in the yellow pages, you remember that thing? Yeah, we used to look in the yellow pages and even when we got to the web, we would just type in, you know, San Jose restaurant and the list would come up, right? And then we would call and we would get somebody to tell us the availability and then if, if we weren't lazy like me and go to the same place every time, you would call multiple ones and you'd go to those silos and you'd get the data that you need and you were the self-aggregator. And what, out, what Open Table did was to become what, what, what I call in this paper an outcome broker, right? So what they did was they went to all of the silos and said, give me your data. And they, they pull that data into a platform that provides them information, education, and technical assistance. And what that does is it customizes the experience to the individual and allows them to have a much better experience. And working in government, you can do that. And it doesn't always need to be technical, by the way. You could look at ITSA as an outcome broker in this innovation that we're trying to drive right now because it's a platform and it's going to be pulling information, education, technical assistance and enabling a whole new thing to happen. So we can drive these changes. And what I like to say, it is about data and it's about cloud and those two things working together to enable new business models to occur. And, and what the trick here is to think about that innovation occurs in the white space between silos. We can get really constrained by how we see the world today and the data that we have, but if we think we can get out into a safe space and come together and work through data, we can come, th come up with a whole new way to think about how to get things done. So, when you think about those outcome brokers and the things that we're building, cloud is enabling innovation across the transportation sector. Smart transportation solutions like smart parking, connected intersections, smart routing, fleet monitoring and connected vehicles are all made possible through cloud technology. And this isn't just about um, the technology, right? Like this isn't just about doing something cool this is, this is really critical infrastructure. If we, if we think about what we're doing here, it is really important. The traditional infrastructure was the catalyst for growth in the 20th century, and similarly in the digital age, including cloud technology, this will be the catalyst for the 21st century stage, surge. And we're at the beginning of that. And it's a huge opportunity. And so the other thing I was told about presentations that was really important is not only have a video, but to have a picture of your kids. Thanks, I needed that. Um, so these are my girls, 16, 13, and 10. Um, I, I asked uh, my 16-year-old, much like Secretary uh, talked about his 23-year-old, 
uh, whether she was going to have uh, a license or not. Was she going to get a car? Was she, well, we was she going to drive? Because maybe you could just give her $1,000 in an Uber or Lyft account, and she'd be fine, right? Um, and maybe we should start asking kids, like, what's going to happen when we don't have traffic lights? What's going to happen? How does that work? What do we need to do? How are we thinking? There's um, two, the, the, that's sort of the two reasons why I wanted to, to um, leave you with this thought with, with the kids there, which is we are entering into a whole new phase, a whole new digital era, and there's so much that we can do. There's so many missions that we can take on. There's so many problems to solve. There's so much cool stuff to happen. We can't stay constrained in the things that we're doing today. We have to be thinking about the data. We have to be thinking about the infrastructure. And we have to be striving and working really hard for these kids. Because we, we have a huge opportunity in front of us and, and we, need to, we need to achieve it. We need to get there. So my question I ended, what mission are you gonna take on? It doesn't need to be the biggest thing in the whole wide world, just, it's just you can take little steps. You can do simple things. Over the long term, we're all gonna have a lot of really big impact. So please let us know what we can do to help. Um, there's a few of my colleagues here in the front if anybody um, had any uh, questions about, about Amazon Web Services or if there's anything further um, uh, you'd like to know, we're, we're here to uh, answer some questions. But I'm really excited to be part of th this uh, platform of a conference that's going to broker some new outcomes, uh, I'm sure, as, as we've been here. And I really look forward to the, to the future and, and what we're going to do to drive innovation in, in smart cities and um, all over the world, how we're going to think about how data and cloud are going to drive new business models. So thank you so much.